Yes, we're there. Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, the final presentation of the AI against all spill challenge. Today we're going to get two presentations and I'm very excited about that. But first of all, I would like to thank our partners, Rijkswaterstaat, of course, who are here today with three men strong to look at your results and also tell you a bit about how they might implement those results uh, for the next iterations. And furthermore, of course, NL uh, AI Coalition, this is the organization that sponsored this challenge, as well as Planet, who sponsored uh, the data that is used by the C team. And of course, Co1, who did a great effort in labeling it. They really uh, spent a lot of time and sponsored all of that in, in, uh, to make this challenge a greater success. I think we can all be grateful for that as well. And this will all work towards the results that all the team members will share with you in a sec. So those will be Leonardo, who is of the Inland Waterways team. So he will present that part of the challenge and then Emil and Ponia together will do the Open Sea Team Challenge. And as mentioned in the end, uh, Rijkswaterstaat will give some closing words uh, before we are all off uh, to enjoy the rest of our evenings with the happy and smushy feeling we got after seeing all those great results. So a bit more on Footprint for a sec. Most of you already know, of course, what we do. So I'll keep it very short here. Very satisfying gradient. It is, right? Nice and purple. So the goal of us at Footprint is to solve humanity's greatest challenges by educating AI engineers at scale with an ethical and sustainable mindset. And our main mechanism in doing so are these AI for good challenges. So we find these organizations like Rijk, Waterstaat, but also many others all around the world that have data and a problem they would like to have solved of which the solution works where it's good. If we find those uh, uh, projects, we turn them into AI for good challenges and crowdsource people from our AI for good community to solve that challenge in a 10 week program. So those are all the happy faces that you see in this uh, meeting today. Um, what they did is work very hard over the last 10 weeks. They grouped into two people with a total of 50 AI for, 15 AI for good engineers. And together they spent over 1200 hours of engineering work. So that is uh, just to uh, give you an insight on how much uh, time goes into these projects. Uh, and I would already beforehand like to thank them all for spending this time. And now let's see what they got with it there. Because the problem here is, of course, oil spills. Well, I don't have to explain why those are horrible and why we need to get rid of them. But of course, if they happen, we need to be able to clean them as soon as possible. And therefore, we need to know where they are and what their volume is. These problems occur in two general biomes, you could say. One of those are inland, so that's what you see here. In havens, those are relatively small, small oil spills, often caused by, for example, a single small boat leaking, not like a complete vat. Um, but then we also have the sea spills, those that you hear in the news more often, I'd say, and those are often even more catastrophic with uh, a lot more oil spilled because these could be oil tankers that actually are leaking, and then we're talking about way larger volumes. Uh, though both we need to respond very qu quickly and need to be able to take this out of the ecosystem before they can do the serious of harm. Uh, and that is what we were trying, uh, the problem that we're trying to solve here, identifying the amount of oil and therefore also scaling up the right amount of cleaning capacity to be able to rid ourselves of this problem as soon as possible. So automated detection of and volume estimation of oil spills and satellite data and drone imagery of uh, the, uh, the Haven ones. So this challenge we kicked off uh, 10 weeks ago uh, over the period of 15 of August until today. These people have been busy with working on, uh, well, of course, researching the problem, educating themselves on the different technologies that are relevant for the problem, then work towards an idea of, okay, this is how we can tackle the problem and presented that in the midterm presentation. From that point, they have been working effortlessly to also implement those solutions and get us to the results that we can see today. So I'm very excited for that. And uh, that's also why I will stop talking now and give the floor to Leonardo, who will present for the Inland Oil Spills team. Um, I'll just go right ahead and jump in. We are the Oil Inland Spill team. And what I'll be talking to you about today, or showing you today, we'll just give a brief overview of the problem statement. Sako has already done a good job about that. So I will... I'll go over it very quickly. Um, again, the historical spill, we all know most of it, but I'll ha highlight just a few. Um, of course, for this work, we have to go into the literature a little bit. 
to understand what people had done and see if we could do those as well to avoid reinventing the wheel. Um, then I'll let you know the people who did the work. Um, I'll show you the results and I will conclude finally. So we all know the adverse uh, the adverse effects oil spills have on you know aquatic life, the economy um, is really horrible, and millions of dollars or let's say millions of euros have been spent on trying to deal with this problem. And in fact, it affects aquatic life, birth rate, and of course death. So cleaning up these has to be timely. It has to be cost effective. Um, it also has to be, we also, we also have to be able to localize it, right, so that it doesn't spread even more. Um, a quick solution, or should I say an effective solution to this is using AI, because it's cost effective, it's safe, and it's pretty fast. Um, so there have been three worth mentioning, should I say, oil spills in the world. Most of them have been um, sea spills, but I'm still mentioning them here because, um, you know, an oil spill is an oil spill, uh, but these are the ones that have made the big headlines. I guess the world learned a lot from these three. So in the literature, people have, of course, used um, AI to try to solve these problems. And if you take a look at this table in the architecture implemented um, column, you see that most of them have used them um, UNET or some sort of segmentation model. So segmentation just means trying to, in a layman's term, mark the areas in a picture where we have an oil spill. So we, uh, let me say, we stood on the shoulders of giants and tried to um, do something similar to what has already been done in the literature. As you can see in the results, they are pretty good in terms of accuracy, like even getting up to 97% um, using a unit, or even 98% using a unit plus plus. Um, so the people that worked on this project are as follows. Bram, unfortunately, Bram dropped out of the project just a week ago, but he was a project owner. We have Yastika, who was a scrum master. Mohammed, who's a storyteller, he's been doing a lot of writing and myself presenting this. Rasham also worked on modeling and creating these segmentation models. Timothy worked extensively on trying to estimate the thickness of the oil spills. Sahil and Shubham, they also um, provided a lot of support in, um, in terms of estimating the, thic uh, the thickness and they also made some suggestions for estimating the volume of oil in a photograph right now getting into the meat of the whole thing so we had two goals in this challenge in our group first was to segment oil from drone images and the second was to classify the type of spill that we see in that picture i think the first one is quite straightforward why we want to do it we want to know where the oil is in the water the second one classifying the type of oil spill for those who are not familiar with oil spill, um, experts classify these oil spills and that gives a sense of the thickness of that spill. So our thought process was if we can classify the type of oil spill, then, you know, of course we can get the estimated thickness of that spill. So moving into segmentation, we had um, images and the annotations or the masks, whichever you prefer. So we had these drone images and then the ground truth annotations. Um, so on the left, you see an original image from a drone and you can clearly see the oil spill in the water. On the right side, you see the annotation of that image. So obviously these are important for training deep learning models. In terms of numbers, we had we originally had 556 drone images, um, but then we that 556 labeled drone images, uh, but then we sourced data and we were led um, we were led to some more images, not drone images, but airplane images, 
And then from those by ourselves, we labeled 89 of them. So in, um, in total, actually, we had around um, 806 images. And out of that, we separated into training, validation, and testing. So we had 645 for training, 122 for validation, and 39 images for testing uh, the results of the model. Um, now, if you're familiar with deep learning, you know that this is not a lot. This is not a lot of data for deep learning models. Deep learning, <clears throat> most deep learning models are data hungry. So you only see the benefits in a deep neural network when you have a lot of data to deal with. And now besides all of that, we had some challenges in dealing with the data. So um, we noticed some annotations which were not correct. So for instance, um, a pavement was, labeled, was annotated as having oil, but we were not looking at pavements, we were looking at just water. Um, we had some duplicate images which we had to you know, delete and so on. So data cleaning was carried out and then we started working. So, as just to increase the amount of data that we had, uh, one strategy that we used was we divided the images into patches. So these, these images are quite big. So dividing them into patches, for example, here, I have 736 by 736 um, patch. That is still a reasonable size for a neural network. Actually, most neural networks are trained with like, 244 by 244, or 512 by 512 um, sized images. But we divided these images into 736 by 736. And for the training set, we had an overlap of 30%. So that gave us a total of 13,778 images and maths, of course. And the validation set, we ended up with 1,675 images. In the validation set, we did not do any overlap uh, because the validation set should be as much of a representation as real life images as possible. And in the test data set, we didn't do anything at all because then those are the kind of images we expect the system would work on. So this was our data distribution at the end of the day. Um, maybe I should mention here that the patch size and the overlap are variable. So you can look at them as hyperparameters that you know you could that we could play with just to improve the performance. So we carried out a lot of experiments, of course, in these 10 weeks. Um, in trying to because with deep learning you have so many parameters that you want to optimize. So, but some of the parameters that we focused on here are the, seg the segmentation architecture, of course. So for those, I'm mentioning DeepLab V3 Plus. It's an architecture from the DeepMind team, actually, and UNet++. So UNet++ is one of the state-of-the-art architectures for semantic segmentation. Uh, on top of that, we added um, attention um, in the decoder. I apologize for those who are not very technically inclined for using these technical terms, but it is what it is, I'm sorry. Um, and then for the other parameters, we played with the batch size as well. So we went from two up to 32 using a bin search algorithm. Um, and for the image size, like I said before, we played from 256 by 256 up to 800 by 800 and you know the initial learning rate and a learning rate scheduler were also optimized so with all these um, parameters we were um, going to show you what we thought was the best result that we obtained now we we measured our performance using the dice metric the dice metric is just an over is a measure of overlap between the ground truth and the network's prediction so it's a number between zero and one. Obviously zero means there is no overlap and one means it's a 100% match with the ground truth. So after all said and done, we 
we found out that using DeepLab version 3 plus and an uh, efficient net B6 um, encoder with a batch size of 16 and an initial learning rate of 1 to the power of minus 3. And we optimized the dice loss using an Adam optimizer. We were able to obtain a test dice score of 0 0.77. So 0 0.77 is a mean dice score. And I'll show you some samples where we even got dice scores of up to of over 90%, which is great. In, in scientific literature, getting a dice score of over 75, actually of over 70 is considered very good. And in my opinion, for this use case, I think this is also a pretty good dice score, as you would see from some of the images. So what you see on my screen now is some sample predictions. Uh, the green overlays are the ground truth. Red is the prediction and orange or yellow, whatever color you want to call it, is the overlap. So uh, starting from the top left, the dice score of that image is 0 0.95. So it, it, it is almost perfect, but I, let me point to your let me draw your attention to these areas where the network predicts oil, but in the ground truth, it says there is no oil. Um, during one of our sessions, we asked the question, you know, if such predictions were a problem. And the answer was no, because if this oil spill was to be cleaned, perhaps uh, a boom would just be used across, right? So once the drone detects that there's an oil spill, it's not going to come in here and hand pick these areas. It's just going to where uh, probably a boom will just be deployed across there. So considering that fact, this is um, pretty good. And the dice score testifies to that at 0 0.95. We have similar results on this image in the top right. The dice score is 85%, um, but we do have some false positives, as I'll show you later. So the two top images are from drone imagery. The ones on the bottom are from airplane images. So this means the camera, the, the camera here is further away from the water body than the drone images. We obtained these images and you know, included them in our segmentation data just to make the model more robust. So it goes without saying, our model most likely is biased towards drone images because we have more of those. But I put this here just to show you that even for these airplane images, it still does a pretty decent job. And now to show you some images that were not so good. Um, here we have a dice score of 0 0.42. Um, here our model failed to predict most of the oil spills. It just predicted for some reason part of it. But again, um, it might not be my place to say if this is a good image or not, sorry, a good segmentation or not. It, I think it would depend on how, um, how the response to such a spill would be, you know, what would be deployed to um, get rid of this spill in this case. Um, another, another bad example, I would say, is this one here on the top right. So you see there are some false positives. We're not trying to detect oil on land, which is obviously what it is here. Like the model is detecting here, you know, as oil spill. Um, so it is a false positive in this case. Um, so unfortunately, we do have bad results. And on the airplane images, you can see here is a pretty bad one, 0 0.24. It just detects some patches in that area. And finally here, it's a pretty tight corner between the boats, um, but there is an obvious oil spill which the model uh, missed. We just got some part of it and missed most of it, but still at a dice score of 0 0.7. And finally, for the segmentation results, like I said, our our model is biased towards um, 
drone images. So you can see here we have 92% and here zero. We have, I think the model is trying to detect air pollution here. Sorry for the pun, but, um, and in this one, it just totally misses it. Here we have false positives again on the deck. So our model isn't perfect, but um, it does some decent work. And just to show you some samples of what could happen if we play with the patch size. So here we did a patch size of 512 by 512 and, uh, and an overlap of 10% in the training set only. So you, we do see a higher dice score here because the patches are smaller. So on a lot of images, we have 100% overlap because the whole image is just oil spill. And we have so many like that because of the smaller patch size and the smaller overlap. But this is pretty. This is a pretty attractive number, close to ninety percent average. But we see more false positives, of course. And in in a real life scenario, the images are a lot bigger, so we won't be dealing with such small images. We want to predict on bigger images. That's why we have we chose the other model. And quickly in the to classify oil spills, we didn't have any data to perform this task. So we took up the initiative and tried to label some data by ourselves. Um, we had limited time on this uh, to get such data. So what we tried to do was we tried to get a balanced data set of three classes, rainbow sheen and no oil spill. So we divided that data set into 70% for training, 20 for validation and 10 for test. And just to give you an understanding of the classes and the, the estimated thickness that those classes correspond to, that's what you see on my screen here. So if we can classify, you know, these thicknesses, uh, these types of oil spill, then we can also classify the thickness. And in such a limited time, we were able to come up with such results. We tested, um, we, we tested three, four models actually, but the best one was the CSP ResNet 50. As you can see, it performs the best here with an overall, uh, with an overall accuracy of, um, I think it's going over 90%. And just to show you some sample results here of the different models that were tested, using an efficient net B3, on these three images, you can see the predictions and the confidence of the model, 65%, 74%, and 54%, pretty high um, confidences. Um, similar results here for the YOLO 5S. Um, again, similar for the ResNet 50. Again, similar for ResNet 50, but here we see a remarkable difference in the confidence of the model. So if, if we had the time and we had the data to do this, I think we would have been able to achieve even, um, we would have been able to train a really robust model using this idea. And just, I've talked about two. I've talked about two different um, techniques. One for detecting oil, segmenting oil, and the second one for estimating the depth. So you might be wondering, how do we put these together, these two different tasks together? So I created this workflow just to give you an understanding of what would happen. So we have an input image. We pass this image through the segmentation model. Then we get the segmentation, and then from that segmentation we can get the thickness of the different areas that there is oil in that area, um, that there is oil in. So if we split the image into, again, patches and then classify them, then we can get the depth, the estimated thickness, sorry, of the oil spill. Um, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer. Thanks. So sure. thank you, Mark. It was a really great presentation. I already Next one, please. Thank you. All right, so the people that you see here, 
Uh, I worked incredibly hard actually the past 10 weeks. Uh, I'm very impressed with the work that uh, that you guys put in. And uh, we as a team, of course. And uh, Avistin uh, worked on, he actually joined uh, throughout uh, after half the, the challenge already passed. And he still uh, did a great job catching up with the rest in terms of research and worked on uh, predicting thick versus thin oil, oil spills. So uh, areas where uh, there's a lot of oil uh, stacked on top of each other and areas where there's uh, a smaller layer of oil. Alexander did an amazing job uh, working with uh, both MSI and uh, SAR images. And same, same as Punia, they both worked on uh, modeling uh, oil spill from uh, different kinds of satellite images uh, and uh, came up with uh, efficient models uh, to detect the segmentum. And uh, she was our product owner, and she also did an amazing job uh, researching a lot of the uh, areas that we uh, were interested in in the beginning, and then helped narrow it down and uh, worked as well on modeling these these, uh, these images. All right, next slide, please. Right, so the goals that we have are, first of all, detecting if uh, images contain oil spills, right? And uh, we did this using uh, products uh, from satellites. And uh, that means that, that uh, once you get some kind of satellite product from an area of interest, you would see if there's oil in there. And the and, uh, next step uh, is then semantic segmentation, like the other team has performed as well, to see which areas of this image contain oil and which do not. And the motivation there is to proactively identify uh, where that might be an oil spill in the ocean, because the ocean is so big, you cannot go everywhere with a boat and check if it's oil. Uh, so it's a nice, uh, proactive method for um, for uh, governing uh, waterways. And uh, then we can send in drones or other methods to uh, do further analysis uh, for identification and to clean up. And uh, then we want to identify which areas of these oil spills are thicker than the other ones, uh, because 90% of the oil in most oil spills uh, actually um, lies within 10% of, of the thick area. So it's really uh, a, a skewed distribution uh, or like a, a sharp distribution in the middle uh, where you have a lot of oil uh, concentrated in certain spots. And uh, that means that we can also direct our uh, response methods uh, with respect to the, the classification of thick versus thin oil. And then lastly, right, uh, the volume estimation of, of oil spills. So we have, uh, like we saw before, the different types of oil. And based on that, using the bubble method, you could uh, give a volume, volume estimation of, of how much oil is there, which of course provides an accurate uh, guidance towards uh, cleanup and can also uh, help you in comparing effectiveness of different responses uh, or, uh, or response over time uh, once you start cleaning up, of course. All right, so those are the, the goals that we initially had. And um, yeah, the, the volume estimation, as we'll see uh, maybe later when the Pania takes over, is, uh, has proven to be very tricky when it comes to uh, large area image products. Uh, so our research uh, is mainly focused on the first areas that we see here. All right. Yes, great. So these image uh, products come from satellites. And these satellites, have different kinds of sensors. Uh, one of them is a multispectral image, um, a multispectral uh, sensor, which kind of takes different spectral bands and produces images or, uh, well, energy fields uh, for different wavelengths. And doing that, you get, uh, like we with our eyes, we have RGB uh, images, so red, green, and blue, but the MSI uh, sensors take sometimes 11 or 12 or 13 different bands, and combining them, you get, uh, uh, a an image, uh, but you can get different combinations of bands giving you different colors, uh, which we then put into our networks. Then SAR imagery is a synthetic aperture radar, which is an active uh, sensor, as we will see later on as well, uh, that measures microwaves uh, and uh, looks at, uh, I think, height response in the ocean uh, to get an estimation of what kind of objects are uh, where and what kind of materials. Then both of those uh, products uh, lead to, in the end, images that uh, were ready to put into a network. So, uh, well, over, uh, in general, uh, continuous sized images. Uh, so the network can actually uh, do something with it. So it's segmentation, which is um, the first main goal that we had, 
of which you see potential result on the right here, where you have this uh, classification between uh, thick oil, thin oil, or no oil, no oil maybe. And that's uh, the biggest uh, thing that we've worked on the past 10 weeks. Right, then I'll give the word to Panya. And uh, yes. yeah, all right. Okay. Well, here I'll briefly introduce you to the, the two methods of remote sensing, uh, because we do have data from both the methods available. Uh, the first one is passive remote sensing. And here uh, the, the sensor relies on sun's energy as the source uh, in order to capture the images. So you can see here the sun's energy coming in and the reflections are captured by the instruments about the satellites. And like Emil mentioned, uh, we have uh, multiple bands, not just the visible spectrum here, which is just a tiny band here, but also we also cover uh, sections of the infrared spectrum, the very near infrared, as well as the short wave infrared spectrum. And some of these uh, uh, passive remote sensing instruments also contain thermal uh, imaging uh, instruments. So those bands are also available. And here on the right, you have active remote sensing. Uh, these are the ones uh, that correspond to synthetic aperture radar or shortly called as SAR images. And here the satellite has instruments which emits uh, radio waves. And those radio waves are larger in wavelength. So they fall in this particular range. So the waves are transmitted by the satellite and the reflections are uh, called as backscattering or captured back by the sensors. Moving on to the next slide, here we have the data sets that we used uh, in, our, uh, in our team or in our group. So, uh, we identified, uh, Emil took uh, the uh, took most of the work here, did most of the legwork here, and he identified uh, the reports that were available from United States uh, uh, Oceanic Division, uh, NOAA, and those are called Marine Pollution Surveillance Reports. We call them as MPSR shortly within the team. We had uh, over 2,000 oil spill events uh, ranging from 2014 to 2022, September. Uh, initially, we collected only until 2018. Uh, later, during the, in the later stages of the project, we found a way to extract the, the, the oil spill events from the last four years, that is 2018 to 2022. So what they contain is <coughs> uh, reports in PDF format, uh, where you have the analyst from United States government working on not only the satellite data, but also other uh, supplementary sources uh, that are available with NASA. And they determine whether there is an oil spill in a particular area. And we get this particular report. Here you can see this is the uh, imagery that is uh, pasted in the report. On the right here, you see the area that is identifying the oil spill. So what the reports provide, what the MPSRs provide, is the shape files uh, of uh, the oil spills, as well as the, the date and time of capture, along with the instrument from which it was captured. However, we do not have the actual satellite imagery that was used to perform the analysis. And one additional aspect that we had is out of this 2,200 samples, uh, only 120 samples had a segregation in the shape files in terms of thick versus thin oil spills. On the right here, you see an image which is from a multispectral instrument. On the middle here, you see the image from a, a active remote sensing, that is SAR image. And this map, world map here, shows the distribution, geographic distribution of the samples, of the oil spill events that we had worked upon. Most of them are in and around the, uh, the United States or the North American region. Uh, we do not have a geographically diverse data set. So uh, the data set is going to be biased towards uh, uh, the conditions that are prevalent in uh, North America. In addition, we also looked at a couple of other data sets. Uh, one is a SAR data set with 1,000 plus images. Uh, it contained not only oil spills, but also four other classes, like ships, lookalikes, uh, land, and, uh, uh, and ocean. The solution direction that we took was uh, uh, predominantly, or rather mainly based on a CNN-based image segmentation. Uh, we looked at different literatures. 
uh, unfortunately, the multispectral images, that is, uh, uh, images from passive remote sensing, did not have uh, many options which we could implement. Uh, we did find one research paper based on SAR imagery, and they utilized a CNN-based image segmentation approach. And we uh, we followed uh, the, the same approach here. So you can see here the MPSR. This stands for the Marine Pollution Surveillance Reports. We had 2,200 of them. And we had a wide-ranging wide set of instruments or satellites from which the reports come from. Uh, there were more than uh, more than uh, 15 different uh, satellites or sources from which these reports come from. So we focused on the top satellites. Uh, this is Sentinel-1 A or B, which is a SAR or active remote sensing. And same is the case with RadarSat. Whereas here you see uh, in this section, this is all multispectral imagery. Uh, with regards to RadarSat, we did not get access to obtain the satellite images from ESA archives. So we could not move forward on that. And uh, with regards to the other satellites, we did not have sufficient team members, so we did not move forward, move forward on those. And in general, the approach that we followed for all the satellites is to download the imagery. So we had to download the images from uh, different sources, uh, and uh, we sourced it uh, using different APIs that were available. And they had different pre-processing requirements, and uh, uh, especially the Sentinel-1 imagery had uh, lots of pre-processing requirements that we had to take care. And fortunately, we had a cloud-based uh, solution that helped us uh, uh, speed up the process. And once we pre-process and get the actual satellite imagery, uh, which is going to cover hundreds of kilometers, then we pick up that imagery, and then we perform our exploratory data analysis. And I will talk about that later. And for Sentinel, we Sentinel One, we used uh, Sentinel application platform toolbox, which is called Snap, uh, to perform manual analysis to understand the data. Whereas for the multispectral uh, instruments, we used uh, uh, spectral reflect reflectance curves and histogram plots to understand uh, the the distribution of data. And then we cut out the regions. Uh, that are smaller in size and manageable for our models. And those also contain the areas where oil spill is reported. And then we split the data set into train validation and test. And we built separate models for each of the instruments uh, because they all have different bands. Uh, so we built separate models for each instrument. So here you can see some of the samples that we have from the image segmentation. On, on the left here, you see the SAR imagery from Sentinel-1. Uh, here you can see that a sliver of uh, oil spill, which is, this is the ground truth, or the actual uh, area where oil is present. And this is the results that we obtained from the segmentation model. So as we can see here, the model did a fair job. It's not accurate. Uh, but then considering that we have a lot of noise in here, uh, it did a fat job. And here you have another <coughs> SAR imagery. Here you can notice the oil spill. And uh, this is the actual oil spill that is present. And this is the prediction that was made by the model. Uh, as you can see here, it is not very accurate in here. Uh, even though there is not much noise, uh, you can uh, the model uh, did not uh, accurately make the prediction as per the, the actual uh, mask that is available here. Now, let me show you a little bit about this uh, custom band ratio and the RGB composite image that we created in terms of how different it looks. So on the top, you have the RGB image, that is the red, green, and blue, uh, similar to your photographs. And on the bottom pane, you have the custom band ratio or the new index combination that we used. So you can clearly see that this area here is prominent uh, in the custom band that we created, the custom combination that we created compared to this one. In the second image, you can see that the RGB is better. Uh, the custom band ratio combination 
is not bad, uh, but the RGB one is better. And in here, you see some of the samples which looked like this, which were uh, which were very low resolution. Uh, and uh, these are probably smaller areas of oil spill. And you can see here that from RGB, you're able to make out the oil spill, whereas in the custom ratio, uh, you have complete noise over here. But then there is a pro and cons with both of them. Uh, unfortunately, we could not do this analysis for all the images. Uh, what we did do is we did train a few models on RGB, and most of the models were trained with the custom ratio because we validated uh, more than 20 samples manually, and we found uh, randomly, we found that the custom band ratio was turning up better than the RGB sample. Here you can see some of the results, results that we have from the model. So this is the true image from the satellite. Uh, this is the this is not the RGB version, rather this is the uh, the custom band combination that we utilized. Uh, this is the actual oil spill, and on the right you have the prediction by the model. The first one, uh, the accuracy is uh, is decent, but it's not hundred percent accurate. But then we also uh, are not sure if some of the markups that we have in these reports are accurate because some of the, many of the markups that we noticed were uh, were were not very accurate they contained uh, a margin uh, of uh, what do you say error uh, they they included certain areas which are part of the sea in addition to the oil spill as well so that did also impact the model in terms of arriving at a good uh, uh, set of parameters as you can see here in the bottom pane, uh, if you look closely, you can see there is a tiny difference in the image. And this is the oil spill area, but the model was completely wrong about it. Uh, I'll quickly skip this slide. Uh, Alexander will talk about it in the end. But coming to thickness estimation of all the 900, and 900, and, uh, 900 samples that we had from active remote sensing, that is SAR imagery, none of them had a thick versus thin segregation. So we had to resort to analysis uh, for thickness estimation using the multispectral imagery. Uh, we utilized one of the research from a paper referenced here, uh, which proposes a decorrelation stretch of the red, green, and blue channels, or blue bands, to discriminate the thicker oil from the thinner oil. Uh, what we found was the, uh, the paper was limited to a particular geography, and it does not generalize to uh, our uh, data set well. So we probably need to explore uh, for different methods of thickness estimation. So coming to the, the lessons learned, uh, with regards to the solution, uh, we worked with a diverse set of instruments, as you saw, multiple satellites. So it would be good if we can harmonize uh, these different satellites, uh, maybe not SAR versus MSI, but within multispectral, if you could harmonize all the different multispectral satellites and uh, work with them together, then maybe uh, that would be efficient. And we found inconsistencies in oil spill mass, which I talked about earlier, which was a challenge for us, which affected the model's accuracy because the masks covered not only oil spill but also some of the areas of the sea as well. And multispectral images uh, were noisy and distorted uh, compared to the SAR images, and we had to discard about 25% of the samples from multispectral imagery due to this reason. And thickness estimation uh, that is was a very hard challenge. Uh, as you can see, the oil spill oil spills are very tiny in the satellite images compared to the inland oil spills, which you saw in the previous presentation. So the problem is, uh, is uh, similar to finding a needle in a haystack. So we need to uh, probably research more to arrive at uh, different methods or novel methods that can help us uh, detect uh, the thickness of the oil spill from satellite images. The key takeaways that we have from our project or our group is that number one, uh, we have the data sets and the approach, the scripts to obtain the data sets for Sentinel 1, 2, and Landsat 8, uh, which 
others can utilize. And we have identified a new oil spill index for one each for Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8. Uh, we need to mathematically and rigorously check the validity of this index and whether it generalizes well to other geographies. Uh, but that's an analysis that we can take up for future. And what we see is that a SAR-based detection is more accurate than multispectral uh, imagery-based models. Uh, and what we also notice is most of the literature is related to SAR-based detection. Uh, and uh, multispectral imagery is a challenge that even the researchers are also working actively on. So we do need uh, extensive research to, to get better accuracy in both the models, in both these products. And with regards to thickness estimation, there are three more approaches that are based on experiments conducted by scientists uh, on, uh, on, on water tanks where they fill in different oil types and they measure it from uh, a plane or a drone and they, def they find out the difference between the spectral signatures. But then whether it can be generalized to satellite imagery, that's a question that we need to explore further.